we're talking about fructose not being a problem, talking about carbohydrates not being a problem, assuming that's the case, assuming that you've, you're kind of on those arguments. The only thing against sugar, well, there's two things, I guess. One is there's no nutrients. Two is mm -hmm. there's no phytochemicals or anything. I agree. It makes it less good than those other things. But everyone in the low carb sphere talks about, you know, eating tons of coconut oil, MCT oil, using ketones. Those are the same thing. It's fuel yeah, with no point. nutrients, yeah, fuel with no nutrients, point. no phytochemicals, yeah. and no one's saying, "Hey, don't do that." It's nutrient poor. Yeah, it's the, no one's saying, "Hey, that's the same as white sugar." It is. There's no pro. Like, if you're eating a nutrient dense diet and you're adding extra substrate, extra pure carbohydrate or pure fat, it shouldn't be a problem for most people. Uh, again, is it ideal? Is it as good as whole fruit or maple syrup? or something else with some good phytochemicals and uh, some good nutrients? No, but it's not like the, it's not the devil. The bioenergetic view in terms of evolution really dictates something different, which is that the availability of energy will drive our complexity. And so if we're in an environment, there's a two way street with our environment and there's a lot of really great evidence for this, uh, but we can dig into it, but also part of it I'm sure is outside the scope here. But basically if we're in an environment that is more energetically favorable, it'll lead to greater complexity, greater brain function, greater ability to, to function. That is going to affect our genes in that way, as opposed to this idea that we're stuck with our genes and those just function on random mutation. That's uh, the current dogma. It's all random. And so we just have to conform to our genes. Right. Other, we're just, we're not gorillas because of random mutation, not right. because we found more nutrient dense food or. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. That's pretty That's pretty hard to accept. Calorie restriction is the same as the winter. It's the same as the low-carb diets. It's the same as the fasting. It's we need to turn those dials down. We need to cause that stress. That's how we live the longest. And that research does not, and we. I think, I don't know if you've dug into this, dug into on, on our podcast at all. If not, I'm happy to dig into it now or point people to some episodes I've done on my podcast, but that research doesn't hold up. If we if we dig into the that research in more depth, just like the fructose causing uh, increases in fat in the liver. If we really pick that research apart, it does not support that calorie restriction extends longevity via stress or via calorie restriction. There's so many confounding variables. Jay Feldman in person. If you're watching on YouTube, this guy came to Sacramento for a podcast binge. <laughs> Yesterday, we had Mark Bell's Power Project. The studio is still warm. The mic is still optimized for your voice. So thank you so much for, for joining me in person, making the, making the long trip from, uh, from Mexico now and then heading back to Ecuador is your, your deal, huh? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. We got rainy weather for you. And then special thanks to Andrew, our man mm -hmm. in the studio here with professional skills of jumping in any time when you <laughs> yeah, either. We, it's my pleasure, man. I, I just like, I was telling Jay on the way in, I'm like, dude, for Brad, like it's, he's, he's our buddy. It's always a fun time hanging out with you. So it's really my pleasure being here. Uh, most importantly, did you have your 10 eggs for breakfast this morning? Oh man. See, I, I was a little nervous about this question. So truth be told, I was running late. Uh, Come, in, in Sacramento, we don't really know how to drive. Uh, and then you add rain on top of that during rush hour. I was like, dude, I know I need to get out of the house a little bit sooner. So I only had four eggs today because I didn't have enough time to eat all 10. So I just, I made do with that. So that's, that's what I went with this morning. But it's the first weekday that I've missed in probably like three months of eating 10 eggs a day. Nice. We'll see if you yeah. run out of gas. You yeah. can make like the cut sign when we're at a certain <laughs> of the podcast. Andrew's running out of gas. No, yeah, we'll be good. Um, yeah. How about Jay? What did you have for breakfast? I mean, first of all, you approve of his 10 eggs, so we're in good company here. And then <laughs> what about you? Yeah, well, it's funny. I was So I cracked open one of the, my eggs today and it had two yolks in it. And I uh -huh. was thinking, oh man, that was Andrew the egg god giving me an extra one because I wasn't having enough. <laughs> yeah, I was forcing it to happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I once had a dozen of the uh, vital, it's called Vital Farms, the, mm. the widely distributed pasture raise, great company. They partner with local farms until you see them all over when you travel. And like every egg in the dozen was a twin. And I was kind of freaked out. Like, is this a genetically modified uh, experience here? I even called up the company and they're like, no, you just got lucky and all that. But I'm like, <laughs> it gave me weird feelings, man. If we're talking about the healthiest natural eggs out there. But yeah. yeah, a lot of yolks. Mm -hmm. So you're on the B Rad podcast for the fourth time. We keep digging in deeper and deeper and deeper. And like we've been talking about off camera, um, I feel like we're um, we're at a very important fork in the road. Those of us who are extreme health enthusiasts and listening and to a lot of content, reading all that stuff, and then we have some, you know, some significant 
uh, differences of opinion and really loud, strong voices and great scientists like the quote from Gabrielle Lyon on the Power Project show when she was talking about David Sinclair's work and she said, he's a great scientist. I highly respect him. He's just wrong about a few things. I'm like, what a beautiful and nice way to say that. But it seems like um, you have a very uh, measured and perhaps controversial take on some of these things. And I'm wondering how you reconcile that personally when you're looking at the great work of other people and the studies and the, uh, the scientific research that contends this and contends that. And then we're going we're gonna to jump to, I think, the, uh, the, the crux of the matter in this comparison of being a fat burner, which is the highly regarded essence of ancestral living versus being good at burning glucose and prioritizing that. Yeah, so... <laughs> There's obviously a lot of different opinions out there and there's research supporting different views. And a lot of it also has to do with the interpretation of the research, right? We're looking at the data, but how do we interpret it? But the, I, th I think the place that we want to start is that we want to put ourselves in a position where we can think critically. And in order to do that, we have to separate ourselves from our views. So we can't hold on to our views too tight hmm. because if we do that, anytime we try to challenge them, we'll have a reflexive response where we won't want to uh, to explore the possibilities as far as where they could be wrong. And I think that's where science starts. I think that's where learning starts. And the step after that is when we come across new information, we want to evaluate it critically, try to fit it in with our current paradigm, see whether or not it makes sense. And if it doesn't, we can kind of push it to the side. And if it does, we could consider it, dig in deeper until we can reconcile mm -hmm. those two things. And so when I was writing an article, let's say, about sugar and inflammation or about the omega threes. You know, the places I would start are the areas uh, are with the opposing views, right? It's where where is this research coming from saying that sugar is a problem or saying that omega threes are really great? And let me try to understand that as deeply as possible so that I can see the potential flaws in it and then mm -hmm. come across the opposing research, the opposing values, the opposing support, and reconcile those things and and see where it lands and. Sometimes that process results in a lot of frustration, results in a lot of uncertainty of not knowing what's right. You have to go through that in order to get to a point where you're confident in your answer. But I think that is the only way that we can learn. And that's, and I know we're kind of getting tangential here, but I think that is not what we're taught in school, right? We're taught, here's an answer, mm. regurgitate it back. Columbus discovered America and brought, uh, you know, gold and silver to the continent. Yeah. Yeah. And we're said, you know, here's a textbook. Everything in it is right. Memorize it. And then, <laughs> you know, tell it back to me. And that's learning. Mm. And that's not learning. That's, that's, it's regurgitation. It doesn't require any thinking. Mm. That's not what science is either. And so I think that is the starting place that we want to work from. And we want to learn to the best of our ability until we can come to a point where we're confident. And we have to consider, of course, there's limitations to the amount of time and understanding that we have of the research or mechanisms or whatever it is. And that's okay. We just have to get as far as we can and continue to work on it. And then the other piece is experimentation. And I think that's another mm -hmm. tool that we can use to determine whether some view is correct. And obviously it's something you're doing, what, maybe six months into your current experiments mm -hmm. with bringing some carbs in. And so I think that's the other piece that's really helpful in terms of, of a tool for how we can learn. And that's another piece that we're told to discount, right? It's mm. not about your experience. It's not about how you feel. It's about here's the, the hard data. So I think those are the only two ways forward. And if we're doing that, then having people out there with opposing views isn't a problem. It's just a part of the learning process. And we're all going to disagree. And that's, and, you know, looking back through history, there's so many times where we know every scientist agreed on the wrong thing. Everyone <laughs> thought that, you know. The Earth's the center of the universe, Exactly. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So I think that comes with the territory and um, that's that's just a part of the learning process. And yeah, I'm obviously I don't agree with a lot of the, you know, a lot of the people out there in, in terms of low carb, in terms of fasting, in terms of caloric restriction. And there's good reason for that. And we'll dig into that. And I would encourage everybody, anybody listening, not to take what I'm saying at you know, face value and just say, oh, Jay said it, so it's right. Like, no, to take a look at the sources I'm citing, take a look at the mm -hmm. research I cite in my articles and in my podcast show notes and everything and come to your own conclusion. I think that's the only way forward. Well, also you and Mike Fave, your sidekick on the Energy Balance podcast, have a good 
track of experimentation where you went deep into many things. I don't think we've talked about this on any of our shows. So maybe you could take us back to your uh, your college years when you were athletic, super health conscious, studying the, the, the subjects that you were leading to and went deep into certain uh, dietary patterns and had some revelations. Yeah. So even in high school, I was already digging into primal paleo, low carb a little bit, um, you know, bulletproof coffee, the whole deal. <laughs> Some high school kid comes on campus. Or, Sorry, I was late. I was making my bulletproof coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I was not a fan of coffee at all. I only ever started trying coffee because of Dave Asprey, because of the bulletproof coffee. Mm. Um, and now you continue to follow everything he says. Exactly. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> Jay wants to live to be 180. Yeah. You got some years ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and being somebody who's very committed to health and, and ran into Mike, you know, my freshman year of college, and mm. he's also somebody like that. And so we doubled down and went from the lowish carb, you know, still kind of bodybuilding style, higher protein, but mixing in some coffee to full on ketogenic and then mm. a little bit of cyclical ketogenic doing the intermittent fasting. And, uh, we struggled a lot uh, and I can't speak exactly for Mike, but I was there and we had very similar experiences where energy, libido, focus, uh, the things that were supposed to be just absolutely optimal on this diet. You know, you're supposed or, to, or in your 20s, right? You shouldn't be having problems with those things. Yeah, totally. Oh yeah, totally. And that was not what we were experiencing. And, and uh, we were also struggling heavily with hunger, you know, feelings of mm. restriction, major desires and cravings for carbohydrates. And uh, lifts, you know, we were big on on weightlifting at the time, doing some powerlifting, and uh, we're struggling there too. We were not progressing like we knew. We found out later that we could have been, mm. both in terms of building muscle and in terms of you know improving strength, and uh, you know focusing on the class, you know, our classwork and and studies and everything, and mood, you know, all those things. Sleep uh, were not anywhere near where they could be, and so we were open at the time because of those experiences. We were open to alternative possibilities and when we were exposed to some information suggesting like, Hey, maybe there's some pieces missing here. We, uh, it took us a little while. Like we didn't just jump into that, but we were, you know, it's like, Oh, that's, that's interesting. And so we looked into it further and started dipping our toes in. Right. We were still of the belief that fructose was absolutely a poison. So we were mm -hmm. bringing in a few, you know, small amounts of carbs, but it was only the starchy ones, mm -hmm. you know, some ri white rice and plantains and things like that. Uh, because we were, you know, still very fearful of the fructose. So we, it was a, it was a couple of years of, of transition there, uh, when, from when we first came across some of these ideas to implementing them. And, um, but I would say once we reached a certain threshold, there was no, uh, turning back at that point. So, uh, you were also, uh, young, fit, athletic, hard performing, hard studying, busy, uh, healthy males with healthy body composition. So, would you contend that was your your major problem is you weren't a candidate in the first place to thrive with keto, fasting, carb restriction, and then maybe talk about who might be those candidates that really um, could experience a breakthrough from, from going in that direction? Yeah, I think that was part of it. I think that also the promise of these diets for most people is this is the way to longevity. This is the way toward optimal mm. health. This is the way toward best performance whether you are on one side or the other. Right. For all of us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so I think maybe we realized it sooner or had the experience sooner that it wasn't working for us because we weren't benefiting from the beneficial components. So we, this is something we've talked about. <laughs> and that kind of sucks because there might be some drawbacks, but at least you should get your, uh, you know, increase mental clarity because your ketones are higher. If that's not happening, then... Why the heck did I miss out on my morning bowl of fruit? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So when it comes to keto and fasting, I think there's major costs to the stress there. And we were experiencing mm -hmm. those costs. Mm -hmm. There's also some potential major benefits, right? To avoiding the carbs. If you're not oxidizing that glucose well. If you can't take those carbs and produce energy, you're going to do better with some fat and ketones. We know that's the case in some of those diabetes, Alzheimer's, things like that. And besides diabetes, Alzheimer's, are there other people floating around in the super training gym that are fit and doing their thing, but they're not good at carbs or something? Uh, yes, <laughs> definitely. I mean, if we're looking at average, the average person is some level of insulin resistant for sure. Even an average fit person that seems... An average fit person, maybe not so much. Well, I mean, Timothy Noakes was running uh, the Comrades Marathon, double marathon, a very fit 40-ish person, and he was uh, on his way to diabetes and insulin resistance. True. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, it's probably going to happen a lot less so, right? Somebody who's already got good body composition, they're going to be more likely to be insulin sensitive and, yeah. and have good glucose metabolism. Uh-huh. But it's definitely not a guarantee yeah. for sure. So we're on a spectrum somewhere. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then the other benefits, right, supposed to be, well, largely will come from the gut health side. So we're relieving ourselves of all these potentially toxic uh, exposures from our gut, from the endotoxin production, the bacterial production of different... Right. Uh, a, a war on carbs, title of Mark Bell's book, uh, with the bagels on the skewer <laughs> of the, the bayonet. Um, but you're talking about those adverse consequences of eating shitty carbs instead of cutting carbs in general to get... Yeah. You're going to get to that benefit, but it's sort of a blanket approach rather than... Yeah. Yeah, and and also the relief from poor gut health. And so so in somebody Oh, cuz you're fasting you and you're not feeding the bacteria <laughs> with all the fiber from the carbs or <laughs> Right. So if you skip a meal when you have poor gut health, you're going to get a boost in energy whatever. Yeah. Yeah, or if you're eating things that you're not digesting too well, yeah. like, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of hard to digest foods. Yeah. So with so with that in mind, those were benefits that I wasn't particularly experiencing because I wasn't in a position to gain from those. But as you're saying, if somebody isn't in that camp, if they are particularly overweight or they're struggling with some major health issues, they will experience those benefits. And so they're going to have a more positive response. I still don't think that that means that's the best route forward, mm-hmm. but it can at least mean that, that it could be a... St- Maybe for that person, it's a step in the right direction. Maybe yeah. it gives them some more control or some more desire to make changes because they're seeing some benefit. Fine, if that's if that is the best first step for someone, that's okay. But I at least don't want to make the don't want to go along with this notion that this is the optimal way for humans to exist or to create an environment yeah. for health. And yeah. I think there's a lot of other first steps that would also work that wouldn't come with the stress. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is important to acknowledge that first step. Um, Mark Bell said this, I think, on our podcast, that a lot of people have emotional issues related to eating and lack of control and constant access to shit. And so any departure from this unfettered access to indulgent foods is going to be a health awakening because now you're on, um, you know, on the program and you, you got you got something to answer to like, oh, I'm cutting my carbs below 50 grams a day. So um, that said you guys are bombing out in college to go back to the story. So something, something's got to give here. Yeah. Well, and, and I will say those ben like the stress catches up to you. So in somebody who is having the benefits, again, if that's a great first step for you, fine. I'd prefer other first steps, but if that's what you want to go with and it, you get some weight <laughs> loss and it gets you the ball rolling, yeah. the, at least that's like some movement in the right direction. But then let's let's transition away from that because that stress will catch up. And that's normally when, I, when you see these people who really crash on these sorts of approaches and their sleep is way compromised. Their libido is gone. Their skin health is gone. Really struggling. Yeah. Um, it reminds the, me of uh, my friend in LA who had uh, had a succession of lousy relationships. And so he was going to swear off all females. And that was his departure from this negative pattern. And so it totally worked for a while, but then you get lonely and you're, you know, but it, it works. And so, sorry to interrupt, but it's like, you can, you can make this um, analogy to all kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Just clear out the crap and then, you know, now you're now you're climbing out of the hole. Now what? Right. Okay. So you guys were finally fed up with uh, you know, craving uh, a pizza more than the the females on campus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and and we we weren't those type of people, right, to be going for pizza. It was our binges were on frozen blueberries and strawberries you know <laughs> um that was, Ooh, that was shame our, on you all right. that fructose <laughs> yeah yeah um so what about this fructose thing because there's best-selling books out now that uh, this is evil it's going to mess up your liver um maybe a little sidebar there yeah it could be a big one but, yeah you know depending on how deep we want to go but the the general from the people who are anti-fructose which is a pretty common view now it's one of two things the main one is fructose like alcohol is going to go straight to your liver and it's a poison, it's a toxin, it's going to drive inflammation and it's going to be converted to fat. And to say that is, it's just incredibly misrepresentative of the reality. It's, is it a, I made a really stupid analogy in one of my articles. I think it was a one about sugar not causing inflammation. I was basically saying that it's the equivalent of saying, if you go in your car, you'll die. 
And mm. what I mean by that is if you go in your car, you might accidentally drive to the hospital and at the hospital, people die. So by like, in, that is the equivalent logic of saying like, don't drive your car because you might die. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm trying to get at is that, yes, this can happen if you consume fructose. If you consume fructose, it will go to the liver. 1% of it or so will be converted to fat. And that's really not an issue at all. There's always flux of in and out as far as fat stores now, go. Now, if, if someone's going to challenge that, Jay, you're full of shit. Half the fructose gets converted to fat. Or, I mean, because you wrote in the article, you said something like, you need 40 uh, the sodas or something to, to you know, get over this threshold of uh, that conversion, which we're so familiar with, that fructose goes into the liver and it's lipogenic. So, the... So, so to start, like that is a pathway it can happen. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the people, we don't have to name names, they will highlight this pathway and say, this is what happens when you consume fructose. And it's just, it's, I don't, you could say it's intellectual dishonesty. I don't know what you want to say about it, but I think it's, I think it's irresponsible. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, that can happen. It, a, it will happen more if somebody has fatty liver disease, if they've got other issues going on, if they're in a diabetic state, that pathway will be activated more, but it's not because of the fructose, it's because there's already dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Now, in a healthy individual, a normal human, one to at most 5% is normally the range that's given, but normally it's going to be 1%, and that's not really disagreed upon in the research. Hmm. Normally, when you see people who are citing the research saying that fructose is going to cause fat uh, accumulation or, or conversion to fat, we're looking at rats, and that is a huge problem. Or we're looking at very ridiculous situations where we are either consuming fructose sweetened beverages, where it's just pure fructose. You know, mm -hmm. you're talking 50 grams three times a day in a in a you know mixed in water or something, which does is so far from what exists in any food. Even even if you want to take Skittles or like any candy, those are going to be about 50 50 in terms of fructose and glucose, if not 45 55 to the fructose because of high fructose corn syrup. But there, you don't get 100% pure fructose, and that matters a lot because we don't digest pure fructose very well. Mm -hmm. And this happens in rats as well. So what they'll do is they'll give these rats or give the humans a lot of pure fructose, and we need glucose with the fructose to absorb it well. Mm -hmm. So when we don't absorb the fructose, it continues down farther in the intestines. The bacteria consume it, produce a lot of endotoxin, that lipopolysaccharide. That goes to the liver and creates an inflammatory state that mm -hmm. drives a lot of fat production. And this mm -hmm. is... There's like very clear diagrams and graphics mm -hmm. from the research studies looking at what happens in rats when they consume pure fructose, explaining this exact process. At no point is it just fructose comes in, it gets well absorbed, we're in a normal like we're in a normal healthy state, it goes to the liver and just becomes fat. That's not that that's not the reality. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I think it's there's a lot of irresponsibility maybe going on there. But uh well, the high fructose corn syrup, which is now on its way out, you don't see it on labels much anymore. Is that an example of something that's been altered so adversely that you could kick this pathway into a significant amount if you're drinking a few sodas a day or whatever? It's still really far away from 100% pure <laughs> so fructose. So high fructose corn syrup's okay? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not a fan of high fructose <laughs> yeah. corn syrup, but it's only about 55% fructose. So it, you're still really far from 100% fructose. Uh. And yes, uh, amounts can matter. So... So when it comes to how much of the fructose is going to be converted to fat, what happens when we consume the fructose, it goes to the liver and there are so many things that will happen to it before it becomes fat. The fat is only if those other areas are all saturated. So mm -hmm. the first thing that it does is it will use that, well, maybe not chronological order, but it'll use that fructose to produce energy. It's a fuel. Liver needs a lot of fuel. It's our most fuel intensive organ other than our brains. And it's pretty close to the brain, like very close. Mm -hmm. So it has a huge energy demand. That's the first thing that it'll do. Second thing is it'll store it as glycogen. We can store uh, about 100 grams of glycogen in the liver, which then gets used by our brain, the rest of our bodies. Super important. So that's, again, just for reference as, tar as far as talking about fructose and cans of soda. Each can of soda is about 20 grams of fructose. It's about 40 grams of sugar in total. Mm -hmm. So that's the equivalent of five cans of soda worth of fructose in your liver. To, store the, to, to, to max out the liver, you need five five full cans of crappy soda. If yeah. your glycogen store in your if liver was empty, zero, which yeah. doesn't normally happen. But just yeah. Yeah, just for reference, we're talking about it can, you know, storing a lot of Stores fructose. A lot. Yeah. The other thing is, if there's too much in the liver and it doesn't need it, it'll convert it to glucose and send that out to the rest of the body because your muscles store glycogen, they use glucose, your brain uses glucose. So it'll convert that fructose to either glucose, it'll also convert some of it to lactate, and that can be used by the rest of the body. So it shares it everywhere else. And it's going to do all of those things way before it's going to convert any amount of it to fat, mm -hmm. unless there's already dysfunction going on, mm -hmm. unless your liver is already burdened, unless there's already a major inflammatory state. And so that's, 
yeah, it's it's way it's very far from this notion that fructose is a poison and, and just gets mm-hmm. converted to fat. So if you exercise even a bit and uh, regularly drain your muscle glycogen a bit, muscle glycogen also adds up to a, a whole ton of uh, total 400 500 grams in the body and 100 grams in the liver something around there yeah yeah about yeah. 400 in the muscles that's the standard numbers but it can go as high as a thousand and someone who's an athlete they can store as much as a thousand grams of of uh no wonder of no wonder christian blumenfeld is doing seven hour 21 minute iron man okay he's going on that story we're going to talk about that later too um so anyone who's reasonably active and can as they say the you know the um the, the muscles are the glycogen suitcases and so they'll take that soda even if it's a adverse form of worse than eating a bowl of fruit, whatever. Um, but then we have a large segment of the population that's inactive. Their liver and muscle glycogen stores are by and large full all the time. I guess that's the the disease pattern that we see. And then they're eating um, whatever they're eating, the, the pizza and the sodas. Now we're looking at a disease state where that person might want to cut back on fructose as well as all the other shit they're eating. Potentially, but here <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. Here's the thing. I don't think draining the glycogen stores is purely the solution because mm-hmm. if the dysfunction is kind of separate from that, of course, activity is beneficial, but if we're using glucose well, if we're insulin sensitive, if our livers are not burdened by lipopolysaccharide exposure, by endotoxemia, <clears throat> if they're not burdened by PUFA, if they're not burdened by nutrient deficiencies. They can handle a lot of carbohydrate, a lot of fructose. And when we consume enough, it'll tur- we'll get enough ATP. And that's one of the main centers for our hunger control. So if we consume enough carbohydrate to produce ATP in our livers and in our brain, that'll turn off our hunger signals. And we're not going to want more carbohydrate. We're not going to want more food. So we these signals are already functional. If we're functioning normally, those signals are there. If we're eating not Franken foods, if we're eating... Mm. The food, you know, foods that are low in PUFA, that are easily digested for eating good quality foods, good quality carbohydrates and whatnot, then we don't have to worry about overeating so much. Those signals will, will go on their own and they'll tell us like, hey, we've got enough. And so we don't have to even worry about draining the glycogen stores and just using all the carbohydrate because mm. our brain will tell us, hey, we've got enough food. So mm. is activity good? Yes. But, mm-hmm. but I just think uh, it's not even necessary per se for the hunger regulation and preventing overeating. Um, what What's going on then when the hunger is dysregulated and the morbid obesity is uh, occurring? So in obesity, we don't have that efficient conversion from food to energy to ATP. Mm. So we're consuming all this food, but in, because of the mitochondrial issues, because we're not converting it efficiently to energy, we're ending up with still a lack of ATP. And instead that food is being shunted toward body fat. So the hunger signals stay on because our brain, our livers are saying, hey, we don't have enough energy. We need to keep eating, but we're not actually using the food that's coming in well. So by the time we maybe get enough energy to turn those signals off, we have so much excess substrate that's been stored as, as body fat. Now, the issue is not the overeating. The issue is not that we're consuming too much food. The issue is that we're not using that food efficiently and converting it to energy. We're either not getting the nutrients needed or there's all these other things that are blocking our mitochondrial function that are then leaving us in this state of of you could call it excess appetite and overeating, mm-hmm. but it's more of uh, an issue with energy production. Which are totally hand in hand. You, if you have low energy, where are you going? I'm going to the candy machine at three o'clock at the office. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or the French fries and all the poofo, which is right. going to make it worse. Yeah. Um, okay. So back to the, the younger years when you guys pulled out of your hole and decided to, I guess, experiment with the next level or, or get back to a healthy state. What was going on there? What did you do? So, I mean, initially it was bumping up the carbohydrates a lot, uh, bumped up the calories a lot. And good good choices of healthy, nutritious carbs, what kind of... Yeah, well, so as I was saying, we were, we were very fearful of fructose at the time. And uh, <laughs> because we were told that it was going to cause the inflammation, cause liver fat, all that. And so we were counting our fructose grams and instead sticking with mostly starches. So a lot of white rice, a lot of plantains. I don't think we were doing too much in terms of potatoes. And uh, so that's where we started and we were feeling better in some ways, but we did have some gut symptoms and actually some weight gain to start for one that's probably because we jacked up our calories quite a bit. Um, and we were putting on muscle at the time, but the other thing too, was because we were focusing so much on these starches, we we're actually doing ourselves a disservice. And when we then transitioned mm. toward 
consuming more of the fructose containing foods, more of the fruits and juices really supported our digestion a lot better and was much less of a burden than all the starchy foods. And so the weight and inflammation came down a decent amount. Um, <laughs> so I don't think we talked about this either, but like, you know, just the notion of recommending orange juice is so far off the, the beaten message and track. And it's even, um, you know, like, like I said, I've been experimenting now, it's seven months into this thing where I'm just trying really hard to consume as much fruit as possible, extra carbs, extra calories, extra protein. I'm just eating more food, weigh the same, same body composition. Um, so it's an interesting experiment, but like, um, you know, I forgot what my question was, but... The orange juice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, how did how is this going to rise back to to prominence when people have been shaming uh, practices like that for, you know, the the whole ancestral health movement. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody has to consume the juice, right? If, if uh, someone wants to stick to whole fruit, I mean, by all means go for it. And I, I do recommend that for, especially the people who are, who struggle more with insulin sensitivity and in the body composition, normally they're better off at least starting with whole fruits for sure. And, and easing in, if they're coming from low carb, like easing in, doing it slowly. But for someone who's particularly active and has very high calorie needs, our digestion can be a limiting factor. So Big so, time. Yeah. Uh, 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 Stan Efferding and uh, uh, the others at the, the highest performing levels, that is the limiting factor for a bodybuilder. Yeah. As Stan describes, they're, they might even get bigger muscles, but they, they can't eat enough food. Same with um, Tour de France or uh, Ironman level triathlete where the waking hours are spent training or eating food. And there's some thought in exercise physiology, even that like the performance advantage is who can absorb and, and digest the most calories in order to fuel the next day's training. Yeah. Well, and, and Stan has been, Stan Efferding has been inspired by Ray Pete's work as well and his research. And he's also a proponent of most of these things. Um, I know there's maybe some small discrepancies, but yeah, t talk about him and um, g give a little bio info. I don't think we've talked about him on on any of our podcasts, but I know it's a big inspiration to you, and he's got a a good following and so forth. And it's a kind of a counterculture um, scene there, like a you know a, a, a cult um, following the work of this um, this aging scientist. But um, he's got some really compelling uh, research and some notions. Yeah, and yeah. controversy too. I think people are also anti uh, the whole scene. Yeah. And so I'll come back to Ray Pete real quick, but I just wanted to say, so as far as things like juice, dried fruit, the real concentrated forms for someone who is limited by their digestion, those things are key. And I was definitely in that place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. definitely in that place. When, I mean, I was consuming five, 6,000 calories a day. Mm. I was, you know, 200 to 215 pounds at the time, you know, depending on the, the month we were looking at and pretty active lifting, biking and stuff like that. So I needed huge amounts of those things to fuel myself without being uh, without having a huge burden on my digestion without that being limiting. So those things were really important for me. And when I switched from trying to fuel myself on pure starches for, ca uh, for carbohydrates to those other things, it was a huge relief in terms of how I felt in terms of my digestion and led to a much better situation. Uh, so that's, and that's when those things are most helpful when somebody's struggling with digestion or when they have high calorie needs or also for, uh, I don't want to say convenience, but for availability. So when it comes to something like orange mm. juice versus fruit, it's hard to get ripe, good fruit mm -hmm. year round. Uh, it doesn't exist in most places. And carried on the airplane. And, you know. Yeah, I mean, they have to pick it when it's super unripe, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually a problem. There are some toxic components in there before mm -hmm. they're ripe. And uh, and yeah, it's, sometimes it just is not going to be available. So the good thing about juice that's pasteurized is it's picked when it's ripe. And then because it can stay good for a long time, they don't have to worry about what's in season at that moment. So mm -hmm. you can always get ripe grapes and grape juice or ripe oranges and orange juice. So I think that's another thing to consider. And it goes for dried fruit as well. Yeah. Also, also another marginalized food that I've brought back with a vengeance. I can't believe when I'm at the store checking out with these giant bags of stuff at Trader Joe's or grocery outlet, but um, it's it's become a centerpiece, especially with this open season in my personal example. But um, as I've shared with uh, numerous people, um, I'm also super active, possibly more active and more energetic because of the dietary change. Um, but for those who are constrained on that energy expenditure side, um, getting the suggestion to go and add some orange juice to the game when they're already fighting this stressful and ongoing battle with maintaining healthy body composition, not allowing that spare tire to come about, um, 
that that gets challenging for people to to grasp and to even consider. Yeah, and that's normally a situation where I would say. <laughs> Not Talk to Jay Feldman, energy, <laughs> jfeldmanwellness.com has a per- personal one-on-one consultation. But yeah, you're going to need some help and convincing and some open-mindedness, I suppose. Yeah, and start with the fruit. Start with the whole fruit. Start yeah. with, the, like, start in slow, ease in. And and uh, there's other options too, right? Squashes and, and root vegetables. You, that is maybe a situation where we don't want to start with orange juice or, or some other juice. And yeah, th- I think we have to evaluate everyone on that individual basis. But to say that the juice is poison and it's the equivalent of sugar water, which I don't even think is poison to begin with anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> We saw this guy at Starbucks getting the little packets of sugar and just going, oh, sugar, <laughs> uh, sugar, sugar, sugar. Sugar, sugar. Uh, He's talking about me. I was yeah, putting yeah. sugar in the coffee. Yeah. Um, sugar's got this insanely, it's this, this, um, they need a better understood. PR firm. It, yeah. yeah, it does. It yeah. needs some, some better PR. <laughs> Look, here's the thing. So we're talking about fructose not being a problem, we're talking about carbohydrates not being a problem. Assuming that's the case, assuming that you've, you're kind of on those arguments, the only thing against sugar, well, there's two things, I guess. One is there's no nutrients. Two is mm-hmm. there's no phytochemicals or anything. I agree. It makes it less good than those other things. But everyone in the low carb sphere talks about, you know, eating tons of coconut oil, MCT oil, using ketones. Those are the same thing. It's fuel yeah, with no point. nutrients. Yeah, fuel with no nutrients, point. no phytochemicals. Yeah. And no one's saying, hey, don't do that. It's nutrient poor. Yeah. It's the, no one's saying, hey, that's the same as white sugar. It is. There's no pro like if you're eating a nutrient dense diet and you're adding extra substrate, extra pure carbohydrate or pure fat, it shouldn't be a problem for most people. Uh again, is it ideal? Is it as good as whole fruit or maple syrup? Or something else with some good phytochemicals and uh, some good nutrients. No, but it's not like the it's not the devil. Same on the fat side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and to blame from all the negative foods that we have, the sh- the <laughs> white sugar that's in there is not the problem. We're talking yeah. about processed white flour, wheat flour, which I think is a huge concern. We're talking about a lot of um, seed oils, the omega sixes especially mm-hmm. that are in there. Those are where I'd be pointing the blame, not the table sugar, not the white sugar. Well said, yeah. Um, so you you got into Ray Pete's work, and that was an inspiration to turn the corner. Yeah. So that so when somebody, I think when people have the reflexive negative attitude toward Ray Pete, it's because he he's painted as table sugar and milk and orange juice, and anyone who like has a reflexive negative reaction to that is going to say he's a quack, he's crazy. Mm-hmm. But for one, that's. I mean, it's I, I, obviously misrepresentation as well. I mean, his his work is to me very impressive and goes far beyond nutrition. I mean, he's a goes into philosophy and politics and uh, biology and all sorts of areas and, mm. and ties it all together in a really um, really intriguing and wonderful way. So I'm I'm a big fan of his work from all all of those perspectives and you know talking about critical thinking and learning. I mean. Those are an anti-authoritarianism. I mean, those are key components of his view. I mean, he's not someone who creates prescriptions or says like, yeah, you should be doing this thing. It's let's think critically and let's mm. let's think openly and let's consider let's just consider these possibilities and let's not subscribe to some authority who says this is the right way to do it. You know, let's question things and let's mm-hmm. think critically. I mean, that's his, his some of his biggest uh, views more than anything else. But he is also someone who turned me on to some of these ideas that sugar isn't the devil and carbohydrates aren't the devil. And maybe there's some reasons why we want to consider fueling ourselves at least partially on carbohydrates over fats. And, um, and he's also, I would say probably the earliest person talking about problems with polyunsaturated fats with the omega Mm sixes, with seed oils, also with omega threes. I mean, that's, that's everywhere now it's super mainstream now, but he's been talking about that for decades. I mean, you were saying he's older, he's 85 years old, I believe. And, uh, um, yeah, he's been talking about these things for a long time. And interestingly, he was also an advocate of low carb at one point. <laughs> All right. We got a cameo from Enzima. Yeah, baby. Just grabbing some said mail on the box. That's all I could read. If you're watching on YouTube, huge cameo from Enzima. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, was just, it was slightly off camera, so it's okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they're not going to know what we're talking about. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I think Enzima's shoulder was in there. I had there we go. the camera. That's on all we need is a giant ass shoulder I know. Yeah. <laughs> that he was clicking and clanking in the gym yesterday. I'm like, I can hear those clicks from across the room. Is that good? <laughs> I don't think so. Keep working at it though. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess you call it the bioenergetic model. Is that kind of Ray Pete's uh, yeah. Yeah. moniker? Yeah. So- yeah. So yeah. as far as looking at health and physiology and even evolution and, and also, you know, any species and, and any even goes beyond that, just looking at, at biology through what's called this bioenergetic lens. And Ray Pete's work is building off of the work of a lot of earlier researchers, 
Uh, Albert St. Georgi, I believe, is the one who wrote a book called Bioenergetics. And uh, he, I'm pretty sure, was a uh, Nobel Prize winning scientist. There's a handful of others uh, who Ray will reference quite often. There's some really great work. But yes, the idea, the largest idea that, that he's putting forth when it comes to our health is this bioenergetic model, this idea that the availability of energy is what drives our health mm -hmm. and uh, that allows us to function in in our optimal capacity, allows us to live the longest, all, you know, it extends our longevity and, and feel our best. And this isn't something I would say anybody should take at face value, right? I mean, well, it sounds the, like a pretty face value insight that uh, the energy, our health depends on our ability to produce energy. Yeah, well, yeah. And if you look into any disease process, you see mitochondrial dysfunction, issues with ATP production, mm. issues along the electron transport chain. Mm. Those things are all key features of every single disease process. Yeah, and I think undisputed what you just said. I don't think you're going to have a counter opinion on this mic next week. Yeah. Although some people will say that's not the cause. Maybe right. they'll say that that's more of an effect, but I would say that that is the central piece, right? We have to figure out what's causing that. Like, of course, it doesn't just happen. There has to be something that causes issues with energy production, but I would say that that is the central piece. And we should be orienting everything that we do around how is it going to affect our ability to produce energy. The supplements we take, the food we take in, uh, the food we don't take in, mm -hmm. our movement, our sunlight, our conversations, whatever it is, I think all those... If we're orienting it toward what we think is optimal health, we want to be orienting it toward what is going to lead to the most amount of energy produced and available. So. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that leads us to this fork in the road where the foundational principle of the ancestral health movement is let's go back and honor our ancestors and become fat adapted so we don't have to rely on all this modern nonsense like six meals a day and all the things that are disparaged now and having to snack your way through to maintain your energy. All this is so uh, widely criticized because really, um, you know, through the, the crucible of evolution, we've adapted to be really good at making ketones for our brain or fasting through periods of famine and still being functional. And so you should get like that too. And um, boy, I mean, it make, makes sense on the surface of it because when we look at modern society, people are overweight, unhealthy, like no other time in the history of humanity. Um, so the starting point seems clear. And then we start to get into cloudy waters when it comes to what is the best way to energize and, and achieve that vaunted status throughout life of being an energy producing machine. Yeah, when well, you touched on what I do think is the one of the root differences, which is the evolution piece. So, the, the, the I know you were saying, hey, it makes sense, like bioenergetic view, energy drives health, makes sense. But most people aren't actually taking that view. What they're saying is our genes drive our health. Our genes mm -hmm. are set in stone. They've been set in stone based on millions of years of evolution, and we need to conform to what they dictate. Mm -hmm. And so, if in our past they were formed based on various stresses that we experienced. We need to mimic those things to get to optimal health. And the bioenergetic view in terms of evolution really dictates something different, which is that the availability of energy will drive our complexity. And so if we're in an environment, there's a two-way street with our environment, and there's a lot of really great evidence for this, uh, but we can dig into it, but also part of it, I'm sure, is outside the scope here. But Basically, if we're in an environment that is more energetically favorable, it'll lead to greater complexity, greater brain function, greater ability to, to function. That is going to affect our genes in that way, as opposed to this idea that we're stuck with our genes and those just function on random mutation. That's uh, the current dogma. It's all random. And so we just have to conform to our genes. Right. Other, we're, just, we're not gorillas because of random mutation, not right. because we found more nutrient-dense food. Or <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> I never thought about it that way. That's pretty. That's pretty hard to accept. Yeah, well, and we're just here randomly. We didn't work hard to to go find the good food and build a better tool. We just got lucky. I mean, is that kind of the Darwin thing where the the beak had a mutation and then that bird got lucky and and got more food and reproduced more? Yeah. So basically, what it what it means. So from that Darwinian view, it's like if somebody one of a human would have had to have a mutation that allowed them to handle something new and improve from that. And then that could lead to a derivation of our, of mm -hmm. our genetic profile if they were fitter mm -hmm. and they survived more and reproduced more. Mm -hmm. And that's going to lead to certain, adapt certain changes in our genetic line mm -hmm. that we can then use to, to, you know, then that's going to be like our template. 
Um, but instead, if we're talking about this two-way street here in terms of our genes, in terms of ep epigenetics and all of that, then instead, if we're in a more favorable environment, it will actually affect our genes. And that alone can determine the direction of our evolutionary path. Seems like both can be valid. Uh, and you know in interplaying i mean they can be but the kind of neo -Dar so darwin was in favor of this idea there's what's called the neo darwinian view of evolution mm -hmm. which is the more prominent view right now that's the central dogma of biology and and medicine and everything right now which is that it's a unidirectional situation it's genes only and it's only random and there's no direct impact of our genes from our environment. Yes, now there's epigenetics, but that's only temporary. It only affects you. It doesn't like actually mm. get passed down. And uh, it's just turning things on and off. But as far as the, the genes, it's set in stone. And uh, yeah, and so the, that is, it might sound like a small discrepancy, but then if we take that to compare it to the ancestral you know, view, right, which is that we should be doing what our ancestors did. That's what our genes were built around. As opposed to the idea that we can create a better environment that will actually allow us to complexify mm. further. It'll allow us to grow toward better brain function, better function in all sorts of ways, greater capacity. Then that I would say that's what we want to lean toward. We want to lean toward our, our like what is potential, like what we can get to as opposed to resorting to what we can get by on. That's heavy, people. We're, we're getting deep here. I mean... Um, it, it, that's a, that's a pretty important leap in thought. And what occurs to me is like, we're not, uh, in the ancestral time period anymore. I was joking to you yesterday about my sticky note where it says, um, don't eat fruit in the winter time because it's against our ancestral genetic experience. Winter was a time for fat storage slowing down. And so the fruit's going to make you fat, especially in the winter. And for years I've made a concerted effort to avoid the fruit in the winter. And then I'm thinking, okay, well, Southwest Airlines just had a flash sale for 30% off Hawaii tickets and we we booked three trips to Hawaii. So just like last winter, we did the same thing. So my winter entails flying to the tropics and going on hot, sweaty hikes and then going to the farmer's market and grabbing the papayas and the mangoes and chowing them down. And so the answer is, what freaking winter are we talking about now when I just turned the thermostat from 71 to 72 because I'm a little chilly. And so you can make a thousand similar examples. Another super important one is like today's high-performing athlete, Dr. Tommy Wood says, cites research that today's CrossFit star, Ironman triathlete, ultramarathon athlete is burning six times more calories than the busiest hunter-gatherer in the history of the human timeline. And so we have no comparison to those guys that were scraping by. Like you said, what's, or I say, what's possible, what's optimal is the, the, where we really are compelled to think right now because we know it's possible to survive a long, dark, cold, freezing winter with no food in, in a cave and walking around and then hunting something fully on ketones because we haven't had any sugar in three weeks, but we're starving and so we can do it. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in qualifying for the, the, the old man master's track meet. And so how can I get my body to this point that my ancestors, they ain't going to drop a sub 60, 400 meters. I guarantee you there's no, especially no 57-year-old ancestor that's going to hang with me. Yeah. And I think we talked about this on, on our last episode too, but in terms of saying like what winter, I mean, for the millions of years of our evolution, we were in tropical areas that were- <laughs> Oh, forgot warm about that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's only 30,000 years ago yeah. that we actually left tropical warm climates. 30 or I thought it was 60 that we first left. We left Africa, but we were still staying mostly tropical. Oh, or oh right. We were, go we were going, um, we we're actually going east, um, uh, Oppenheimer's human migration across the globe. I don't think the website's up uh, right now. They're like fixing it, but it's a beautiful thing where you click the button and it shows the years and mm. the path of human migration. I didn't realize we went all the way over toward Indonesia, Australia, then back, then finally up to Europe. So most of the time until the last little sliver when we got freezing cold and had to deal has been papayas, mangoes, or whatever the ancient <laughs> fruit that Denise Minger talks about in her blog, where they did have these gnarly sweet fruits back then as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and then instead of thinking, even if we want to say, all right, last 30,000 years in cold latitudes, that is normal. And we're supposed to just barely scrape by in the winter. We aren't stuck with that. We can evolve. So <laughs> Southwest.com. Right, yeah. right. And that's Use really the code, discount code slash Brad Kearns. No, I'm just kidding. I got to talk to Southwest about that. But anyway, <laughs> right. You can, well, you can turn the thermostat up. Well, and that's a group like on, in terms of our physiology, we can turn the, turn the thermostat up. We, if we can create a better environment than that, then we can go further. And so that's, 
the orientation that I would take as opposed to we want to mimic these harsh conditions, those are turning down all those dials and that, those come at a cost. And so, and this is not like we can take this then to come back to some of the most central research, coming back to the calorie restriction, right? This is calorie restriction is the same as the winter. It's the same as the low carb diets. It's the same as the fasting. It's we need to turn those dials down. We need to cause that stress. That's how we live the longest. And that research does not, and we, I think, I don't know if we've dug into this, d- dug into on, on our podcast at all. If not, I'm happy to dig into it now or point people to some episodes I've done on my podcast, but that research doesn't hold up. If we, if we dig into the, that research in more depth, just like the fructose causing uh, increases in fat in the liver, if we really pick that research apart, it does not support that calorie restriction extends longevity via stress or via calorie restriction. There's so many confounding variables. And so I, well, it's I, all rat study anyway, right? There's rat study. There, I mean, it's, there's nematode study, right? A lot of mm-hmm. it's based on C. elegans, these nematodes that hibernate. And so you put them under stress and they're going to live way longer, but it's because they hibernate. And that's A, coming at a huge cost to their function. B, it's not actually a longevity extension of health span or even lifespan that translates to humans at all. So there, there's these major confounding variables. I mean, other ones too, you mentioned the rats. So in those studies, they compare calorie restriction to ad libitum feeding. And what they find is that the <laughs> calorie restriction group only extends lifespan so much as the ad libitum group gains weight. So the ad libitum group, the ones that are able to freely eat as much as they want, they get overweight, sick, and die early. That's why it looks like calorie restriction extends lifespan in those rat studies, not because the actual calorie restriction is beneficial. Yeah. Restricting your intake of shit food will extend your lifespan. Well, and in fact, like spot, talk about confounding variable. There's plenty of beautiful examples of people who have lived a life of moderation rather than excess, and they did really well. My father made it to 97 years old, and back in the 60s, he was a physician and interested in health and research, and he decided to... Um, you know, optimize his diet and start thinking about these things a uh, way long time ago. And that served him really well by comparison to the average Joe Blow who was has been raised on TV dinners and fast food and all that. But I think we hold on to so strongly to these examples like um, the, the sparse, moderate dietary intake, not a lot of stress, everything's nice and chill, and they, they go for a long time. Yeah. And so there's there's a couple of studies, a pair of studies, I believe it was on chimps, two different zoos, where they were looking at calorie restriction. So one group or one of the studies, the their diet was corn syrup or yeah, it was like corn syrup or sucrose and corn oil, things like that. It was just Oof. fully processed. And they found calorie restriction extends lifespan. Another another study, they look at a whole foods normal diet for chimps and found that calorie restriction had no effect. Mm. That's it's like the exact same same thing that you're saying. That's another huge confounding variable. If you're eating garbage food, eating less of it is beneficial. If you're eating food that's actually appropriate toward what our physiology dictates, then you actually want to be eating more of it as opposed to less. And that used to be the perspective, even in in the states. Uh, so Brad Marshall has some really great uh, information on this, looking at even like the USDA recommendations and uh, the information they're putting forth in the early 1900s. When they were looking at nutrition and calories, we don't even recognize that this current idea that calories are bad and that food intake is bad is fully sociocultural and it's new. It used Mm. to the perspective used to be the more nutrition you could get, the better, the Mm. healthier you were. That was what the rich people got to do. And this is before rich people were all big and super obese, you know? Uh, that it was looked at as like if you could eat four thousand, five thousand calories a day, which people were apparently doing based on the data at that time. What time frame is this you're talking about? It's like in the thirties. Oh. There's this and, and so again, I would look at uh, Brad Marshall's information on this. I don't remember what his article's called, but he reviewed this USDA uh, report. I want to say it was like 1938, 1939, something like that. And they talk about how the in in the area, like the richer you were, the more you could eat, the better it was, the more nutrition you had. They're talking about it as an entirely positive thing. It was there was no notion that that was even tied to any negative health outcome because it it isn't if you're eating good foods. If mm-hmm. you're eating at that point, you know, meat and dairy and and local fruits and vegetables. So these are entirely new ideas that we've that we've come up with based on this terrible calorie restriction research, which is widely regarded as the most consistent way to extend longevity. The, the one thing mm. that's known throughout research to be the most effective way to improve health and extend longevity is calorie restriction. And I, I think it's bogus to, to say the least, to put it bluntly. What if we added on calorie restriction of shitty food? Then it's then all these scientists get to stay on the shelf and <laughs> sure. no, seriously, because I mean, I, you know, I look at these people that we have some very prominent people that have the 
central focus on longevity and they're they're pushing this agenda you could call it to quit eating so much yeah and, and you can but but if you just say it as calorie restriction of the bad foods without <laughs> the other side of eat as much as you can within your limits of the good foods in a way that's not leading to body fat gain yeah. and all of that yeah. if you're not including that last part i think we're still doing a huge disservice you're still supporting this idea that less is better and mm. and i think that's that's yeah. a huge uh disservice and and yeah really something that it would drive our evolution in a negative way, in a negative direction. Yeah. I mean, I, I told you, Dr. Tommy Wood told me this several years ago. He goes, you know, eat as much nutritious food as you can until you gain a pound of body fat and then you turn the dial back and that's how you discover your optimal for a healthy, fit, athletic person. Again, I know we might be getting repetitive here, but I'm uh, on behalf of all the listeners, like, uh, I get the emails. They're looking at me like, yeah, that's great. That's working for you. You're so active. You're athletic. You've been so your whole life. Maybe I have good genes because um, my uh, ancestors did not display a pattern of morbid obesity. But for someone who's right now in the trenches, and this is a guy who deals with a lot of clients, so it's not just theoretical here in the podcast studio, but like someone who's fighting that battle, who's unhappy with their spare tire coming up or has worked really hard in the gym and in the store uh, trying to get those few pounds of fat down. Um, how are they going to buy into this when Jay Feldman says, eat more nutritious foods? So most of the people- Bigger breakfast. Come on now. Get 10 <laughs> eggs like Andrew. Poor Andrew only had four eggs today. I'm going to yeah. wither away. Yeah, no. <laughs> most of the people I'm working with are dealing with serious issues. So mm. we're talking autoimmune issues. We're talking about major issues with energy or fatigue, insomnia. Um, so you're basically getting desperate clients instead well, of... <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that these, I think these principles are even more important when somebody's yeah. in, a, in a state where they're struggling. Well, most what, people are and they don't realize it. I mean, yeah. I, I love that insight um, from Saladino, who I'm, I'm mad at right now, but I'm going to forgive him pretty soon. But um, how do we know if we're at level four trying to go to level five or we're level seven going to level nine? We don't know. And I think a lot of people could benefit from a deep examination of what's going on because you're only at level four, dude, even though people think you're at level eight because you're better than average. Average is probably level 2.3 right now in America or, and the other developed nations. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm so, so to that, like the, that objection, I mean, I'm, I've worked with people with severe fatty liver disease and that would be a case where if you ask most people who are concerned about fructose, they would say, that is the last time you want to be consuming fruit juice, right? That's the mm -hmm. last time you want to have any sort of concentrated carbohydrate like that. And I've seen people who have severe fatty liver disease on scans. They have the elevated liver enzymes, like way elevated, all those things, completely heal their fatty liver while consuming fruit, ju fruit juice freely. Like not, not being concerned. And I'm, again, they're not having gallons and gallons of it. That'd be a great commercial not <laughs> for Tropicana. <laughs> yeah. I had fatty liver and I had my Tropicana every day and now I'm fine. Yeah. So what happened? How did they... So shifting toward the right types of carbohydrates, shifting mm. away from the polyunsaturated fats, fixing the gut health, which is, and when you see fatty liver, you cannot separate it from endotoxemia. It's a huge piece there. And the polyunsaturated fats, both of those directly drive processes that drive fatty liver. I have an eight part series on my podcast, uh, eight part, uh, eight episodes talking about this on my podcast. So if anyone wants to check those out, but so I've seen people who are in that state and just by shifting the types of foods, but freely consuming fruit, fruit juice, all of that, hmm. heal their fatty liver. And, and so what I would say, if somebody's concerned about weight, is that the first place I would start? Would I say like start guzzling fruit juice? No, but I would say let's start changing the types of foods. Let's still include fruit, but let's maybe start with the whole fruit just in case. Let's shift toward the right types of fats. Let's make sure we're getting good quality animal protein in, nutrient dense, like nutrient dense animal protein sources. Let's shift away from the grains. Of course, the processed foods, the seed oils, things like that. Let's address the gut health. Let's use some some other things to support us. Let's get walking. Let's stop being sedentary, mm -hmm. right? Let's get good sleep. If we're able to do those things, the vast majority of people are able to see incredible benefits. They're able to lose weight and all that, even if they're having some fruit juice. Mm -hmm. If somebody's struggling and we need to dial down more, fine, we can do that. If somebody is doing really well and they include more of the juice and dried fruit and they aren't so concerned about that, that's great too. But I think just, I don't think we want to take the extreme example and apply that to most people of like, yes, in the most extreme example, I would say, all right, just whole fruit. But for most people, I think they're okay with, with some juice and, um, I would say regardless, if you're coming from low carb or fasting, start slow, 
transition mm-hmm. slowly, start to, you know, implement these things step by step. But yeah. Did you say walking or did you say P90X extreme <laughs> exhausting <laughs> fitness regimen every day without a... No, you're, yeah, you're supposed to start with marathons, actually. <laughs> <laughs> start training right now. Well, I'm I'm joking, but it does bring up an important point on the other side of that equation where possibly um, I think the fitness industry in a whole is, has some very disgraceful elements where well-meaning people walk through the front door, they sign up with good intentions to do the group marathon training program or go to the exercise classes, the guided classes, and they start messing up the other side of the scale, which we all perceive to be just burn more calories. But this could now talk about a confounding variable. If you're performing exhaustive exercise, that's going to interfere with your goals of dropping excess body fat and getting healthy. Yeah, you're already in an energy depleted state if you're overweight. Most you know, the vast majority of people, you're, you're starting not... with an energy depleted state. Your yeah. ATP, your mitochondria is messed up. So yeah. when you try to go sit on the bike for an hour, it's going to be a, it's like a it's like a Tour de France guy doing the mountain stage or something. Yeah, yeah, you've already got the stress hormones going. Typically, mm-hmm. you're already going to have low androgens, low thyroid activity. Let's start. Yeah, start slow. Let's just work on not being sedentary. Let's work on changing the foods. Those go such a long way. And then let's look at what are your symptoms telling us, right? Are you having these gut symptoms? Do you have skin issues that could suggest some sort of nutrient deficiency? Are you sleeping well? Those are all things I'd be looking at way before saying, get into this really intense exercise routine. If ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, these are matters of life or death that we're talking about. And now we're, we're compelled to bet our life on one of the, one of the forks in the road. And back to this, uh, I guess we'll call it a compare contrast between um, the keto calorie restriction uh, obsession with ancestral uh, practices and trying to model them and biohack our way through them. Although I will give a plug, like if we are at this state where we're not um, challenging ourselves and we're toning down, we're in, in, you know, indulgence, luxury, convenience all the time, then I'm going to direct you over to the Liver King channel and watch him jump in the cold water or do the incredibly grueling uh, barbarian workout once in a while, like all the employees that Ancestral Supplements are compelled to do. Uh, But, you know, mixing these things in can be a great personal growth experience. Same with going in the sauna, going in the cold tub, whatever, because that thing's on 72 all the time, 24-7, and now we become, you know, a wuss to our, uh, to our detriment. But at the same time, you're, you're making that good point that, you know, hormesis is, um, you also have to remember the cumulative effects and how these can add up over time. Totally. And you're, you're right. So there is a fork in the road between these different perspectives and the fat versus carbs, I think is obviously the central point that a lot of people focus on. And that's because that represents that fork too. Are we going to rely entirely on fat and ketones, which is directly in line with the calorie restriction model to get by in as little on, as possible, turn down our metabolic dials. Are we going to go that route or are we going to go the higher carb route or at least moderate carb route with trying to crank our metabolism Mm -hmm. up we're going the hormesis route the fasting route or are we going this route okay gun to our heads everybody (laughs) there's time to bet well and it's time to to throw your chips in yeah yeah well i don't want anyone to go into it feeling that way right i don't want anyone to be like it is i have to put all my chips in one basket or the other i would come back to what we said earlier which is hopefully these are things that you can think about like let's start thinking about it critically Let's dig into the point, like to the extent that we can. The calorie restriction is a great place to start. Fat versus carbs is a good place to start as well, but it does get technical with the biochemistry. I know you wanted to talk about my carbs versus fat article. Um, I think those are good places to start. Like go check out that article and work on understanding the biochemistry to the point that you can. Pull up a chart of glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain and try to piece those pieces together with with whatever in there. I know that it takes time. It took a lot of time for me too to to dig through the research and put those pieces together. But there's like a take us one step at a time. You know, just do small experiments and just just make some small adjustments and do the best that you can to to think critically and learn one piece at a time. And I think that that's the best that we can do. I think that if we go into all of it as as it's as it's black and white and I have to do one thing entirely or the other. I have to just jump into this. I think that we're putting a lot of pressure on ourselves. I think it puts us in a pretty difficult position and makes it hard to challenge our own beliefs. So mm. I do obviously feel strongly that in terms of the bioenergetic model and all that. But uh, yeah, I would say for a listener who's new to that or is not or is like I have some resistance here. Good. I mean, take you know, take it one step at a time. Um, so 
why do carbs burn more cleanly with less reactive oxygen uh, uh, fallout Species, yeah. than um, than fat? Yeah. So so there's. By the way, that's my question is the opposite of the contention that's widely touted that fat and ketones burn more cleanly and carbs d- deliver too much reactive oxygen species, free radicals floating around, causing inflammation, causing disease patterns. That's that's the party line of um, this evolutionary ancestral health scene and the many books that talk about how to cut your carbs so you can get healthier. And And the thing is, somehow that became a tagline, but... The people who are familiar with the research, even who are in favor of low carb, recognize that that's not the case. So the one, the people who are in favor of low carb, in favor of hormesis, they actually recognize that fat oxidation, fat burning, produces more reactive oxygen species, and as such, it has a hormetic effect. It creates mm. ox- oxidative stress that causes a stress reaction. The reason it does that has to do with some biochemistry here. And so the main thing that it's going to do is it's going to lead to a lower NAD to NADH ratio. NAD to NADH ratio is the main determinant of how fast we produce energy. In any disease state, you're going to see a reduction in Mm -hmm. that ratio. In a health state, you're going to see that ratio to be higher. And because of the differences in in the metabolism of carbs and fats, with the fat metabolism, you will have a lower NAD to NADH ratio at first. What then happens, it creates this oxidative stress state. And I explain this step-by-step in that carbs versus fat, which is the better fuel article on my website. Uh, which I would recommend somebody take a yeah, look at. I recommend reading it four to seven times so you can try <laughs> to start getting uh, the, the insights locked in. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it will create that oxidative stress and that creates all these defensive reactions, all these hormetic reactions. One of those things will then say, oh, hey, we have a low NAD to NADH ratio. I'm going to activate what's called an NAD salvage pathway by activating this enzyme called NAMPT. Causes the recycling and then production of more NAD so that you can restore that ratio. But you have to do that via these stress pathways. And so people who are really aware of the physiology will say, yes, keto- ketosis, fat oxidation is hormetic. It creates more oxidative stress. That's a good thing because you have these defensive reactions. And then we get to that hormesis question, which is, is that actually a good thing? Which, of course, I would say it's not. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, man. We're, we're, we're open-minded thinking critically here. Um, and I think you spoke a lot of science there, but one of the ways to, um, um, describe what you're saying is like fat's this survival fuel and it's going to keep us alive when we're starving. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. I always mean to mention that first. I get so excited about the biochemistry, but I think it's really important to keep that context in mind. The whole reason why our physiology responds this way is to adapt to the energy availability, the energetic availability of our environment. So if we're in a state where there's no food available, we have to rely on our own body fat. When that happens, we want to have signals that turn our metabolism down. Because if we're, if we're starving, if we don't have food available and we don't turn our metabolism down, we won't last very long. We will starve way quicker because we'll be running through that fuel too fast and we'll die. And so the survival mechanism is when we're running mostly on fat or entirely on fat with just a little bit of ketones, then we want to have signals that turn our metabolism down to prevent that starvation and death. We It's really great that we have those mechanisms. But the question is, do we want to be in that place all the time? Is that what's going to provide health? Yeah. Or instead, is that just a, a way for us to barely get by when we're in a suboptimal environment? Yeah. But so this is, so when I'm talking about the biochemistry of fat burning versus carb burning, the effects on the hormones, those are all in this larger context. These are, as the signals, like these are all parts of the signals that tell our body to turn down the metabolism <laughs> so that we can survive for longer. Yeah. And the, yeah. then it comes back to that fork. Is that a good thing? Is that our way to health? Or is actually producing more energy with the higher metabolic rate, the route toward health? Yeah. I mean, uh, when I first, uh, you know, got deep into keto, when we were researching the book, I, um, you know, built up my skills to the point where I was rarely hungry and could last a long time without food. And so I got slaps on the back from everybody, including myself thinking, Hey, this is a great thing. Now I'm, uh, I'm impervious to the, the whims and the desperation that we're so used to living on where we need that power bar in the drawer, especially as a former athlete where I was just consuming so many calories. Like if I was without my food if i forgot my bag on the airplane flight you know i'd get on the flight and just eat the whole time and get ready for the next series of workouts uh, but now like i'm never hungry and i feel alert energized and uh, clear clear thinking according to jay feldman and many of the research behind it because i'm kicking into stress pathways that bring 
the fight or flight hormones that give me increased mental clarity, even uh, improved energy and all these things, especially temporary, but temporary could mean three years or three months or whatever we're doing that's um, getting away from the endotoxins and the junk food diet. Yeah, that's relying on those on those st- uh, starvation survival pathways. It's, it's like <laughs> it's brutal, man. I'm, it hurts my feelings to think that I was, <laughs> you know, going going in that direction. I mean, I got to bring up a um, um, a counter uh, point here, a counter question. Mark Sisson, one of the most leading, respected figures, and of course, we worked together for so long. Uh, but what I do appreciate about him just from an independent, unbiased perspective, is his willingness to think critically and be open-minded. And he's been celebrated for being willing to change his mind and change our information. And we revise the primal pyramid subject to, you know, a discussion and evaluation. Um, And I've talked to him at length about these new um, ideas, or not new, but, you know, how the bioenergetic compares and contrasts to this caloric efficiency model that the centerpiece of ancestral health. Um, he contends that he's so good at his metabolic flexibility, his metabolic efficiency has been so calibrated well that he is thriving uh, without having to go looking for extra calories. And in fact, it's not very stressful for Mark Sisson to fast until 1 p.m. and throw down a pretty impressive workout from 9 a.m. to 10.30 and then come back and drink a few sips of water, get on the computer and do his high-performance lifestyle nearing age 70. So if someone has uh, developed this metabolic machinery to become very skilled at burning fat, making ketones, and not showing signs that it's super stressful to do so, um, can this layer in somehow to the discussion? Yeah. And so there's two things I would think about, and this was something that Encima and I were talking about on the, um, there's another metabolically efficient individual that'll throw you on the mat, whether or not he ate breakfast. Right. Right. And and so that's basically basically what we were talking about. (laughs) Andrew's cooking up a soundbite. I can see (laughs) the YouTube clip going right now. (laughs) Anyone else want to plug Liver King? Liver King fast for <laughs> five freaking days every quarter. I do want to throw this in. Like, um, I was, you know, uh, I, I know how he lives his lifestyle and he's so extreme with his diet and exercise and he's so locked in and dialed into the ancestral tenets that that's um, someone who can maintain an impressive physique, impressive fitness level, regardless of the controversy that he's now embroiled in. But it's like, wait a second, how can he freaking do that? and come out of that five-day fast and then go throw down another barbarian workout. Obviously, it didn't stress him like crazy to to do so because he's built up the uh, the, the skill to do so. So we got Sisson, we got Encima, we got Liver King. It's just a, just a throw-in. Mark Bell training for a marathon right now. Yeah. I mean, come on. Okay. Maybe we'll throw Liver King out of it because with some of the new information, it seems like maybe he was struggling with some things that... that right, right. Maybe he wasn't feeling 100%. Or, I mean, if you are you know, uh, enhancing your physiology from outside sources, then you don't fall into the same parameters like poor Brad Kearns who has to take a nap the day after a sprint workout because it was pretty stressful and I'm just trying and hanging on by a thread, trying to perform and recover at an advanced age. Well, and it looked like, and again, this is all on conjecture based on this brand new information from two days ago, but it looked like not only was Liver King using those things to to help support this stress that he was putting his body under, but he was still dealing with issues, sleep issues and whatnot that you were right. talking about. So right. yeah, that, that, that one aside, let's assume we're talking, you know, about some other people who are not doing that and they are feeling a hundred percent. Or so they're feeling, they don't know. They're feeling, they're feeling, they're feeling like Sorry. they're at level nine. They could be at level seven. Right. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. yeah. And that's a possibility. Yeah. But I would say, so there's, there's two main things I would think about. One is that as I've said, Keto, fasting, there are benefits to these things despite the stress. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that benefit can outweigh the stress, Mm -hmm. right? So they could be getting more benefits from these things than not. But I would always rather get those benefits without the stress. And so this is something that, Mm -hmm. again, it it becomes so theoretical. And this is, I think, something that was a bit of the the issue when I was discussing this with Encima is it becomes so theoretical. And he's like, well, I feel good. So I think maybe an analogy is helpful here. If we're thinking about our energy availability, we're going to think of it as in terms of a bank account. And any time that we are putting ourselves under stress, it's a situation where we're taking out a loan, right? We don't have that energy available when we're going for a run or when we're fasting or whatever it is. We don't have that that fuel leading to energy availability. So we have to take out a loan in order to pay for what we're doing, right? Mm-hmm. 
that loan is a cost. And if we rack that up, we're going to say, look, I can't afford to keep doing this. I have to turn down all my spending, right? I have to turn down the money I'm spending, the energy I'm spending on all my functions. That's what happens when we depress our metabolism. Digestion goes down, thyroid hormone goes down, sex hormones go down, mm -hmm. sleep goes down, immune function goes down. All those things happen. So in the case where somebody's, let's say, going for a run or they're fasting and they're taking out that loan, if they pay back the loan, are they okay? Yeah. Like you can pay back the loan. You can eat enough credit after. Card. You, 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 credit sure. card. My interest rate on my credit card is 18.33%. I don't care until I miss the payment. Right. So right. You, can, you can pay it back and supposedly no harm, no foul, right? But if you can get the benefit without needing to take out the loan, and because the goal here is not just to get by, right? The goal is to accumulate in the bank account, right? So if we can get the same benefit from, from the fast without needing to to spend that extra stress yeah then we can yeah. we can get to an even better spot yeah so kind of what you're saying right we can get from the 9 to 10 or the 7 to 9 or whatever it is it's even again even if we're doing okay we're able to handle that stress without it noticeably causing a problem without that stress bucket overflowing causing symptoms mm -hmm. we still want that bucket as low as possible at all times we want that bank account as high as possible at all times that's what leads us to being able to be optimal to create the best functioning we can, you know, highest mood, highest focus, best immune function, best sex, steroid, hormone production, libido, and all that. And with that, building muscle or maintaining good body composition or digesting our food really well, plus longevity. I mean, those are the things that I I would argue are going to drive the best human state that we can. And so, you know, I'm a fan of exercise, right? And exercise <laughs> takes out one of those loans. It is stressful. I think mm -hmm. the benefits are worth it. In the case of fasting, if we can get those same benefits without the stress, we can accumulate more in the bacon count. We can drain that stress bucket even further. I would rather do that. Uh, Mike Mutzel's video, uh, Why I Stop Fasting and What I'm Doing Instead, I think is the title. And he says, he's citing research always. Uh, uh, what was it? Um, a 48 hour fast will kick in these wonderful autophagy mechanisms that are known to support longevity. I don't know. <laughs> we never know when we're, we're talking to Jay. There's no, uh, there's no uh, rhetorical statements like on Rich Roll podcast where they said, uh, uh, what do all the balloon sods have in common? A plant-based diet. End of story. I'm like, end of whose story? <laughs> Your story? Because uh, I don't know about that. Right. Um, but uh, it's a 48-hour fast, has these wonderful autophagy health benefits. Uh, so does a one hour high intensity workout, like the same pathways are activated, the same benefits, the one hour high intensity workout is going to also deliver assorted other health and fitness benefits. And um, if you do both, which I believe is a large portion of the highly enthused and motivated audience, that's when you start looking at Jay Feldman's article, is hormesis even healthy? And the cumulative effects of stress rather than how great you feel after a long fast and or after a high intensity workout. Yeah. And, and that's, I think that's the, the perspective we want to take is there's a cost to doing those things. There's a cost to the fasting. There's a cost to the exercise. There's also benefits. But if we're going to put that cost in, if we're going to be going hard with exercise or we're going to be doing the ice baths or we're going to be doing any you know sauna, which I think is a lot less stressful than something like the, the ice bath. But if we're going to do those things for whatever benefits, then that's even more of a reason that we want to be repaying that, mm. that stress. We want to be taking in even more food if we're going to be an athlete if we're going to be you exercising a lot that we need to be eating way more you know going back to what tommy wood was saying we need to be eating way more supporting way more with carbohydrates the most that we can to get those stress hormones down as soon as possible and so if we can again if we come back to fasting the benefits there are not unique to fasting if we're not eating indigestible food if we're eating food that goes well with our digestion if our digestive function is good if we are using carbohydrates well, then why would we want to use stress toward that, that we're going, that we have to then make up for when we can get those benefits otherwise? That, that's why it just, it just doesn't compute in, from my view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think some people are coming around to this. I, um, I'm, I'm, I've made a list of, you know, prominent figures who are, you know, kind of seem like they're uh, drifting away from this obsession with how long can I last without food to embrace some other ideas. 
Um, Paul Saladino has embraced uh, carbs famously and adding that to the animal-based diet, which I think is a, a beautiful approach because you're talking about the most nutritious foods on the planet. Mark Bell and I are working on a book about meat and fruit because these are like the quintessential human evolution foods and they, they can't be too heavily criticized. I have a video on YouTube saying, here's my big bowl of fruit. Good morning. It was my morning exercise routine. I go, can someone please tell me this is unhealthy for me? Because mm-hmm. I want to hear how someone's going to criticize I just finished my 40 minute workout and now I'm going to slam a giant bowl of fruit and, you know, uh, shoot me if I'm giving out bad advice. So, um, it's, it's a really compelling, uh, argument. And I like the idea of just maybe tiptoeing in that direction. When I heard you on Ben Greenfield, May, early May, 2022, I went into it. I said, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to go to the store and buy some fruit. Sorry, uh, Dr. David Perlmutter, who gave that quote about don't eating fruit in the winter, um, that it's, you know, it's game on with Southwest Airlines included. So um, I I think uh, there's a few nuances. Maybe we could go into the um, the uh, the question list because for once after four shows, I'm actually doing pretty good with my outline instead of completely going uh, uh, into, uh, into the rabbit holes or whatever you want to call them. Uh, but in terms of that last thing about needing to refuel, especially as a high-performing athlete, a 6X athlete compared to the hunter-gatherer model, um, boy, you know, I, I just talked to Dave Scott, endurance training legend, and he's promoting the the low-carb approach to endurance training by virtue of uh, the performance benefit that you get from being really good at metabolizing fat, even as your pace increases or even as your duration continues. I'll also mention Brad Kearns, Mark Sisson in this breath, because we have the primal endurance approach, which is one of the centerpieces is get really good at burning fat so that you don't conk out on the side of the road. And that's undisputed that the, the person who has the most endurance is kicking into fat burning and burning a greater ratio of fat versus glucose. Because if you tried to keep pace with Kipchoge, the greatest marathoner of all time, they had that treadmill at the mm-hmm. major marathon says, how long can you go at Kipchoge's world record pace? And people jump on this big treadmill and they get spit out the back in like <laughs> eight seconds because he's running four minutes, 32 seconds per mile for a marathon. It's insane. It's sprint pace for almost everyone except a greatly trained marathoner. So um, if getting fat adapted is known to have a performance benefit, is this like a different paradigm than us at rest and trying to get through our life when we're going out on a four-hour bike ride? So, yes, it is a different paradigm. It's a different goal. And with that in mind, it's also not the same goal as optimal health or reversing health condition mm-hmm. or body composition goals, right? This is its own goal and it's a performance goal. Mm-hmm. And with that performance goal, it is a situation where it's going to be heavily fat reliant and it's, and I've worked with people who are doing some sort of, you know, extreme athletic endeavors like that, you know, like mountaineering and, and things where there's limited food availability while you're doing it. Mm. It's long-term endurance and it is going to require a lot of like fat usage for fuel. And if that is the goal, I would say, yeah, you want to practice training in that sort of state. I would still say, A, you want to make sure you're eating as much as possible to um, support your needs and reduce the stress after the any activity. And I would say you can probably eat quite a few carbohydrates following the activity to get that stress down and still by the next morning, whatever you're doing your workout, still be in a relatively ketotic state for your exercise. Mm. But yeah, that's a state where you I think you are making inherent sacrifices to your physiology for that performance mm. goal. And it is going to be one where you're you're not going to get very far if you're full on you know, trying to glucose uh, fuel your your ultra right. marathon. So, yeah, I agree. It's it's a state where that's the perspective I would take. Try to mitigate the stress as much as possible. Get the calories in. Use the carbs in as basically as much as you can to still probably train in that carb. Uh, sorry, in the fat fueled state. But yeah, I think that there's just an inherent uh, compromise that that comes from from that sort of uh, endeavor. Um, by the way, Sammy Inkin improved that. You could still remain ketogenic. He did a five-day mountain bike stage race and he was consuming, I think, over 200 grams of carbs a day and he was still 
uh, ketogenic because he was burning so many calories in the race. So once right. you get off your bike or whatever, your long hike or uh, endurance session. Now, if you're going at a slower pace where you don't need to kick in those glucose burning uh, metabolic function, then I guess you could envision yourself as a fat fueled hiker of the Appalachian Trail. And that might be um, a, a good strategy. They talk about the either or a lot. I know you're going to call bullshit on that. So I want to jump to that as the next question. Like, well, if you choose the ketogenic route, then make sure you have all kinds of fat in your in your, in your your snack bag and stay away from those carbs so you can keep uh, your membership in this camp. Or you're going to go um, low fat because, oh, we don't want to get fat when we're eating a high carb diet. What does Jay Feldman say about that stuff? In terms of not wanting to mix carbs and fats in general. Right. Yeah. yeah. Was it the Randall? Uh, the Randall cycle. cycle. Randall effect. Yeah. So tell us about, a little about the Randall cycle cycle and then how that might um you know how that might fly in the the Jay Feldman wellness world. Yeah, so the Randall cycle is something that I wrote a little bit about in that carbs versus fat article and cited some of the research discussing it. Basically what it says is that in an individual cell uh based on what's happening in the mitochondria when you burn fat or burn carbohydrates, it's going to inhibit the burning of the other one. And so if you're burning fat in that one area it's not going to be able to like in that cell or in those right. mitochondria uh, it's going to inhibit the burning of carbohydrates for that moment that doesn't that is a very far cry from saying if you eat fat and carbs together you're going to have a problem because mm-hmm. luckily um, and intelligently our bodies don't like what's going on in one area of the body doesn't dictate what's going on elsewhere and especially in one cell right and so basically you can consume carbs and fat together and certain tissues in your body can burn the carbs and certain tissues in your body can burn the fat. And I think that's a really great situation. So you can consume some fat and, and your muscles at rest will be burning that fat and that's perfect because they don't need a ton of energy mm-hmm. to be produced at that point. They're okay with the slow burning of the fat with all those breaks on the system that we were talking about earlier in terms of biochemistry to, to you know, the kind of, it's basically like a starvation state just for the muscles, but that's okay. They don't need mm-hmm. anything more at rest. Whereas the other areas of your body that are going to be functioning at really high capacity, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, and on from there, those are, can use the carbohydrates and uh, produce a lot of energy from them in, in that kind of clean burning way. And there's no problem in terms of the Randall cycle with that. And so that's well, it's obvious because the brain must use carbohydrates, can't burn fat. Right, right. Or, Unless or, you got or, ketones. Ketones, but, lactate a little bit, but like this is happening all the time. Right. Uh, I guess the it actually jumps to the next question is like this carbs and fat together uh, warning is tied to the hyper palatable foods that we're told if we um, bring these into the diet, we can't stop eating them because they're hijacking our brain's uh, hunger and, and uh, dopamine receptor pleasure pathways. The, the, the many examples of uh, fat and carb paired together with processed foods, cheesecake, ice cream, potato chips, uh, pasta with the, and on and on. Um, so it's okay to eat carbs and fat together. How does that pair up with this warning to watch out for these dangerous foods that are going to get you fat? Yeah, I don't think we have to make our food not taste good in order to not overeat it and in order for it to, to be healthy. Uh, our hunger signals, as we were kind of talking a bit about earlier, are going to be mostly determined by the energy availability, by that, that ATP. And so we shouldn't have to worry about our food being palatable if our mitochondria are functioning well, if we're producing energy well from that food. Now, of course, a lot of what we're calling hyperpalatable foods are high in the seed oils, high in the polyunsaturated mm. fats, low in various nutrients. I mean, they're going to cause a lot of issues with producing energy. So sure, you could say they're going to cause you to overeat, but that's because you're not producing energy well from that food. But if you instead take potatoes plus butter plus salt, That's pretty palatable, but that shouldn't cause any issues, assuming you digest the potatoes well and you oxidize carbohydrates well. That shouldn't be causing any issues in terms of overeating. So I don't think there's any concern there as far as combining carbs and fat or making our food taste really good, as long as our hunger signals are regulated, which comes back to how well are we producing energy, how good is our digestion, how well are we balancing our blood sugar, how like where's our nutrient status, you know? So if we're going to get the handmade ice cream containing sugar and fat, the place just opened in Sacramento, uh, salt and straw, nice line out the door, but like this is a quality indulgence. Um, we're not going to uh, succumb to demise due to the pairing of those two foods. Right. Yeah. 
<laughs> Simple as that, people. This show is sponsored by Salt and Straw. No, it's going to be pretty soon. Um, so you're, you're basically shifting the blame away from the evil food processors that are trying to uh, lure us in with addiction to Twinkies and all that to, hey, how's your energy production going internally because if I feel fine and alert and energetic, I'm not going to want, I might want one scoop or two scoops of the thing, but I'm not going to want to return there every day at 3 p.m. because I feel like hell and I can't even stay awake at my desk. Right, right. And that's different from the Twinkies, right? So the Twinkies, which are going to be filled with PUFA, filled with mm. things that are probably going to irritate It's going to make your- you worse at internal energy production. So there, you're, there's your vicious circle. Mm-hmm. And I guess a good way to um, get close to wrapping up. But like, if you are carrying excess body fat, we got an assortment of problems with your lifestyle choices and patterns, but it's a catch 22 because it's likely driving you to make bad choices. Yeah. And that's not going to change overnight, right? The, we're always adapting to our environment that those adaptations, the longer we expose ourselves to the different environment, the more they set in, the more we adapt to them. And so it's not going to be a situation where I would say start off with the ice cream, right? Because we know the hunger <laughs> signals are going to be off for a while. We know mm. that it's going to take some time to get your your energy production capacity back up. Mm. And so during that state, that's why we were saying earlier, a place to start would be whole fruits over juice or whole fruits over ice cream because we want to get to a better place physiologically first, you know, mm-hmm. health first. Uh, and then, you know, then we can uh, branch out a little bit. Uh, uh, do you think uh, like prescription medication has an influence on things like our hunger, satiety, energy production signals in terms of the side effects? Uh, Dr. Maffetone talks about that a lot. Like he, he will mention any prescription drug has major side effects that's going to affect your ability to burn fat and his model for the endurance athlete. I think it would entirely depend on the medication. So some are going to be activating pathways that I think are harmful. Some are actually, I think, not as bad as far as their mechanisms go and can actually be the better option if somebody's in a dysfunctional state and can't fix the root problem or isn't, a, you know, for whatever reason, isn't fixing the root problem. So I think it would really depend on a case by case. All right. We're in the rapid fire section of the show as we can, as we can feel now. So you talked about PUFA, the unstable nature of those molecules um, and contending, I guess, in the bioenergetic uh, model that all of them could be subject to scrutiny, including the highly regarded omega-3s, which are also unstable, unsaturated. But it seems like there's a distinction. People are saying, go for your good omega-3s, your good uh, unsaturated, and we don't want um, to touch any of them by some, by some account. Yeah, the funny thing is if we're going to say that the omega-6s are, are s- not stable and they're very susceptible to oxidation, we have to consider that the omega-3s are typically twice as unstable. So if you want to compare one of the primary omega-3s, which is, which is DHA, it's one of the components of fish oil, to uh, arachidonic acid, one of the main omega-6s, to uh, monounsaturated fat, the uh, omega-6 type will be about 160 times more susceptible to oxidation to damage. The omega-3, the DHA, will be 320 times as susceptible. So if we're considering that to be the main issue in terms of the, of the omega-6s, I would say it's even worse for the omega-3s. And we see that with all the products. If you look at some of the studies on the fish oil products, they're already damaged and oxidized. Mm-hmm. Then if you look at the studies looking at what happens in our digestive tract with those sorts of products, they will increase oxidation levels and they will become damaged just in the intestinal tract, let alone when you're then introducing them into the whole internal physiology mm-hmm. and all the susceptibility there to damage. So it, they're highly unstable, highly susceptible to damage, so much so that when we have those integrated into the structure of our cells, that's actually shown to be the number one thing that's most associated with lifespan it <laughs> is basically the more omega-3s and the more unsaturated, <laughs> the more unsaturated your yeah. the membranes are in your mitochondria and in your cells, the faster you age and the <laughs> shorter your lifespan. And this is across all species. This is not just humans. This is, this is looking at, at all species. It's like the number one. There's, there's a theory of aging called the membrane pacemaker theory of aging. Mm-hmm that discusses this in more detail, researcher named A.J. Holbert really goes into depth there. So if anyone's interested in that. Okay, we just lost a uh, omega-3 uh, fish oil sponsor. Mm. Okay, we're <laughs> just completely blown out the window there. I can delete those emails. 
Uh, but the highly regarded research and the wonderful benefits of supplementing with omega-3 and eating your uh, high omega-3 foods, is this because of that antioxidant response that you talked about with, with fat metabolism and, and sort of on the same pathway or the same um, thought process as when Paul Saladino talks about the plant hormesis and that wonderful kale smoothie, um, you know, so is so poisonous that it prompts an antioxidant internal defense response against the poison, thereby giving kale uh, a top score in the nutritious foods list. There's probably some of that. I, I haven't seen if there's normally a, a situation where they're touting omega-3s for an antioxidant effect, but I bet if they were, that would be why. Uh, normally, or anti-inflammatory effect. I mean, right, it's, it's giving you an effect, yeah. but is it because of because of the hormetic, <laughs> the hormetic stress of consuming it? It's more of the way that we're viewing inflammation. Mm. So the omega threes do lower inflammation, um, but they do it in a way that's that's harmful. It comes with some immunosuppression, <laughs> and uh -huh, instead uh -huh. of of actually fixing the inflammation problem, they're just suppressing our, our response to it. Mm. And so it will lead to short-term benefits, but it comes at a long-term cost. It's like a drug. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. 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 And um, yeah, so there's some major concerns with it. And with that too, I mean, you can look at the the outcomes, if you want to just look at the endpoints of does it help with cardiovascular disease and depression and all these things, there's a lot of research saying, look, it's it doesn't. Like it, we were told it was and, and what's going on because it's not actually panning out. I have an article on my website. Um, it's about omega-3s. I don't remember exactly what the title is, but uh, I think I might just say omega-3s are not the healthy fats or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. I cited a bunch of that research. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, we're betting our lives on this bottle of omega-3s that we diligently buy for years and years looking at mainstream programming. And now we're compelled to, to rethink that. Right. <laughs> right. Simple as that. Uh, you know what, uh, Jay Feldman, you killed it again. If you're watching on video, we're going to fist bump. You, you come and you bring the heat every time. I appreciate the hard work that you're doing. And you've mentioned your articles. And you talked to me yesterday about this evolution of your career from, you know, still being a young person comparative to, to me anyway. But you've been hitting it hard for so many years, especially that journey of c contributing this content and those podcasts that you guys have published, which are um, largely uh, like, you know, lecture type where you're just going hard for an hour and a half on a certain subject. I know it's a lot of work and the body of work is fantastic. So I direct everybody over there to uh, jfeldmanwellness.com and the, and the Energy Balance podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for joining the Power Project yesterday. You're about to go into the, an adjacent studio to, to hammer it out with Chris Bell. So a lot of endurance here displayed despite his lack of omega-3 intake. <laughs> 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 Thanks for watching, everybody. Thank you so much, Andrew. And maybe we can go get you six eggs now after the, the starting point with this early morning podcast, only squeezing in four. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for having me, Brad. Thanks, Andrew. Shh. Yep.